Good to see you all, and I want to share with you something this morning that I'm simply entitled, How to Excel in the Gracious Act of Giving. Now, just before Jesus uh, went to the cross, he was invited to a dinner at the home of Lazarus. And after the meal, Lazarus' sister, Mary, she takes a jar of very expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she starts to pour it over the feet of Jesus. It was an act of worship and gracious giving that she was expressing towards Jesus. We understand that the value of this perfume was huge, and many thought that it was a wasteful act. Judas, who would later betray Jesus, he made this telling comment. He said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Now, it was customary in Bible times to wash the feet of people when they came to your home, particularly because the roads were very dirty and very smelly because they didn't have nice cars like we have today. There were donkeys and camels and all sorts of animals that would walk along the roads and they would make a mess as they went. So you didn't want people coming into your home with messy feet. So it was customary to have your feet washed but it was also customary to have your head anointed whenever you visited someone's home. But this act of sheer extravagance by Mary in taking this perfume that was valued at a year's wages took everyone by surprise. Had you been there that day, I wonder what your reaction would have been to the act of Mary with this very expensive perfume. You see, attitude is often revealed when we're taken by surprise. If you're driving along in your car and somebody cuts in on you, how do you react? Do you wind the window down and shout? Or do you give a long blast on the horn? Or do you wave a few fingers? You see, attitude is revealed when we're taken often by surprise. And when it comes to big giving, when it comes to giving, the biggest stumbling block is our attitude towards the things that we possess. Let me tell you what the Bible reminds us. The Bible reminds us that we brought nothing with us when we came into this world and we can't take anything with us when we leave. When the ancient pharaohs in Egypt died, they were put in the pyramids and there are some of those pyramids uh, in uh, just outside of Cairo in Egypt. And they put within these burial chambers loads and loads of treasures so that they could take them with them into the next life. Thousands of years later, when these pyramids were opened up, guess what? The treasures were still there. We come into this world with nothing and we take nothing with us. Job understood that because he said naked I was born or I came with nothing and I die with nothing so why do we dearly covet our possessions you see everything we have in life is on loan to us including our money And Jesus illustrated this in the story that Kathy read to us just a moment ago. 
The story is about a king who was about to go on a journey and he was going to be away for some time. And before he left, he calls his servants to them and he entrusts to each of them a sum of money in proportion to their skills and abilities. And he goes off on his journey. When he returns, he calls them to account to find out how they've used his money whilst they were away. But the most important part of this story is not so much the behavior of the servants, but it's what Jesus said at the outset. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by this story. And the whole point that Jesus is wanting us to understand is whether we have a good or a bad attitude towards the things we are entrusted with in life. Two servants behaved well. One servant was lazy and indolent. His attitude showed that he had no desire to please his master. Do you know what the Bible tells us as well? It says this, we must all stand before Christ to be judged. And we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly world. There is coming a day when we must account for the way in which we have lived. A lot of people think, oh, I can get away with this and I can get away with that. And often we see a lot of injustice in our world that hurts. But there's a day coming when everyone will have to give an account for the way in which they have lived. Attitude is rooted in the way in which we think. And in this story that was read to us, two servants had a good attitude, one servant had a bad attitude, and they had to give an account. So attitude is rooted in the way that we think. It's the way in which we view and evaluate someone or something else. Now, I'm just going to show you a little video video because Dr. Miles Munro, he really puts over very well an understanding of attitude. Just watch the screen for a moment. Uh, There are two animals that God identified himself with. Both of them are leaders. One is the eagle, the other is the lion. I always wonder why God did this. But he created them so he knows their qualities and their character. I love them both. I always love eagles and lions. Come in my office, you see lions and eagles all over the place. In my home, lions, eagles all over the place. You know, in a couple of days, we go to Africa. I told my planners down there, I got to go see the lions again. Every time I go, I got to spend time with my cousins. (laughs) And I go and spend the whole day with them. My wife, remember, with the lions, we go there, we spend time with them. Why? These, they remind me of me. They remind me of leadership. As a matter of fact, Jesus says he is the lion of Judah. Not the puppy or the dog. (laughs) the lion of Judah not the monkey or the raccoon the lion God identified himself as a lion you better study the lion because he rules the universe you know God identified with the lion and he rules the universe that means the lion has some qualities that he wants you to study here's some of the lion that's very strange number one the lion is not the tallest animal in the jungle He's not the strongest, he's not the biggest, he is not the most powerful, and he's not the most intelligent. And yet he's the leader. Tell your neighbor there's hope for you. (laughs) What the lion has done is he has canceled all of your excuses for not being a leader. The color of his mane and his skin doesn't inhibit him from being a leader. His intellect, his strength. There are so many animals in the jungle more powerful than the lion. Stronger, taller, bigger, more intelligent. And yet the lion eats all of them for lunch. As a matter of fact, when the lion sees an elephant, he simply thinks lunch. Why is the lion the leader? Because of attitude. Write it down. Just attitude. Attitude comes from your belief system. 
and it produces confidence. The lion believes that he can eat an elephant. That belief becomes the source of his confidence. He moves toward the elephant. The elephant is 50 times more powerful, 100 times bigger, 80 times more intelligent, 60% more powerful, and yet the lion eats him for lunch. Why? Because the lion's attitude reduces that elephant to a meal. This is why he's the leader. Leadership is 80% mentality, attitude, and 20% skill. And this is why skillful people <laughs> work for those with the right attitude. That was good, wasn't it? Attitude. So, if you have an attitude that says, I am better than others, you will look down on everyone else. If you have an attitude that says, I will always be poor, you will live with a poverty mentality. If you have an attitude whereby you're always anxious about your health, you will live like a hypochondriac. Attitude colors and controls our thinking. It determines how we behave. So, my question this morning is, what is your attitude towards money? I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to just read some verses that the Apostle Paul brings. Chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, Paul is speaking about the importance of giving. We've given this morning, we've given extra towards this uh, mission conference that, that Peter and Leslie are taking some of our young adults towards. But let's just read what it says here, 2 Corinthians 8. Paul says, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and yet they're very poor. But they're also filled with an abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So, we've urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish the ministry of giving, since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love for us I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I'm not commanding you to do this, but I'm testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of other churches. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. When you come to know Jesus Christ... When you put your faith and trust in him and discover that he died on the cross to forgive you of your sin, you become rich. Not rich in this world's goods, but rich in eternal values. Because there is no greater riches to possess than to know that you have been forgiven by God and come into a right relationship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ. You are worth more than a millionaire. If you come to know Jesus and if you accept what he did on the cross and you find the forgiveness and the mercy that God offers to us all through Jesus Christ. You are rich. And that's what Paul means here when he says Jesus Christ, he was generous in his grace. Even though he was rich, he gave it all up and became poor so that out of his poverty, his laying down his life on the cross, you could be forgiven and have eternal life. And everybody said, cool, that wasn't very enthusiastic, was it? Thought it was going to be a hip, hip, hooray. Okay, 
This church in Corinth excelled in many things. They excelled in their faith and trust in God. They excelled in gifted speakers, their knowledge and understanding of the scriptures, their enthusiasm and their love for Paul and Titus. This church believed in excellence. But it wasn't matched by their giving. So Paul says, I want you to excel also in the gracious act of giving. So how can we excel in giving? Just point out some things here. I just love to look at the scriptures and draw out what it teaches. The first thing that I discover here is be a generous giver. Paul says, you know the generous grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, generosity is being liberal in giving or sharing. It's being totally unselfish. And the Bible has ever such a lot to say about generosity. I was pleasantly surprised when I started to look, particularly in the Old Testament. The Old Testament people of God, the nation of Israel, were taught to be generous. Let me point out a few scriptures. In Deuteronomy, give generously to the poor, not grudgingly, for the Lord your God will bless you in everything you do. Generosity is rewarded. It says also, the godly always give generous loans to others, and their children are a blessing. It says also again in Psalms, Good comes to those who lend money generously and conduct their business fairly. If you're an employer here today, then take note of that. And also it says in Proverbs, the generous will prosper. And blessed are those who are generous because they feed the poor. You see, generosity was an Old Testament principle, particularly when it was in connection with looking after the poor. Now, to some people, generosity comes naturally. I remember growing up, uh, and in my dad's church, there was a lady there whose name was Mrs. May. And sometimes we, we'd take her out. She was a widowed lady, and, and she'd come out with us, and, and as a little lad, if I looked in a shop window and said, oh, that's nice, she would go in and buy it. And uh, I was tempted to take advantage of her, but uh, grace prevailed. But you know what some people are like? You only have to say, oh, I like that, and they'll get it for you. Some people are naturally generous. It, it just comes without a second thought. For others, it's more difficult. Some people are natural savers. Others are natural spenders. How many of you like to spend money? How many of you are lying this morning? How many of you like to save it? How many of you think twice before you spend nothing? You see, we basically fall into one of two categories. Janice and I have got a friend. Um, he, he was a, her, her youth pastor back in her church where she grew up. And we were with them last week. And we went to some shops. And, and Janice went in the shop with, uh, with our friend Elaine. And Phil, he stays outside. Whenever his wife goes shopping, he goes in a coffee shop. He's just not interested. I like window shopping. Janice doesn't like shopping. I like to go just browsing and having a look. But we're different. Some love to shop, some love to spend, others love to save. Paul reminds us that a spirit of generosity is not to be based on our nature, but on the example of Jesus Christ. If you struggle to be generous, start to be like Jesus because that deals with the difficulties and the weaknesses that we have. And he says, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know about it. That's what he's telling them. You know what Jesus has done for you. You know the great sacrifice that he paid for you. You know the freedom that Jesus has brought into your life since you put your trust in him. You know He was rich, but he became poor so that you could enjoy the riches of his love. 
You see, if you want to know what a generous giver really is like, do what Jesus did. Give your life away for others. And when it says here that Jesus became poor, it literally means he was totally lacking in this world's goods. He did it so that we could become rich in God's forgiveness, rich in God's kindness, rich in God's mercy, rich in God's love. And if you go over to the next chapter in 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, Paul uses the analogy of a farmer and he says, the one who plants generously will reap a generous crop. It's logic, isn't it? He says, God will generously provide all that you need. If you are generous, God will make sure that you generously receive back. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 8. You see, giving is not a debt that we owe. It's a seed that we sow. Turn back in your Bible to Mark chapter 12. Just a couple of verses. Jesus sat down near the collection box outside the temple. Mark 12 verse 41. When they used to go to the temple on the Sabbath, there was a massive collection box outside and people would put their money in on the way into the temple. And Jesus one day just sat beside it watching the people coming and giving. And as he watched the crowds dropping in their money, many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. And Jesus called the disciples to him and said, hey guys, look at this. I'll tell you the truth. This poor woman, widow woman, has given more than all the others who are making their contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. That's generosity. Absolute generosity. So the Bible teaches us that we need to be generous givers. But coming back to 2 Corinthians 8, we also learn we need to be gracious givers. Because he says, you know the generous grace of the Lord Jesus Christ you see without the cross grace doesn't make a lot of sense in the Old Testament times grace was not a common theme but in the New Testament we see that the grace of God is extended to the whole of mankind because the Bible tells us that the law was given through Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ Christ. The meaning of grace is literally undeserved kindness. That's why the Bible says that God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take any credit for it. You don't earn it. You don't merit it. You don't suck up to God and ask for him. It's the grace of God that God chose to extend his kindness to us in Jesus Christ, it is a free gift that he gives because it's by grace. You see, a gracious giver is someone who gives out of the kindness of his or her heart. This is what Paul means when he says, you know the generous grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. For Paul, the grace of God was something that overwhelmed him because before Paul became a Christian, he was a terrorist. He did all he could to arrange the murder of these Christians. When the early church was born, there in the first few chapters of the book of Acts, you can read about it, Paul actually stood and approved of Stephen being stoned to death. And actually, the people who picked up stones, Paul said, look, I'll look after your coats and your bags. And he took care of the coats and bags while he watched Stephen, this great servant of Jesus Christ, being stoned to death. Paul was a terrorist. And he did all that he possibly could to have Christians put in prison, to have them executed, to get rid of this new religious breed called the way. But then one day, Paul himself has an encounter with Jesus Christ. And he is radically transformed. He comes to know the grace of God. He comes to know that God was prepared to forgive him 
for all the murderous actions that he'd been involved in. And he is overwhelmed by the grace of God. This is why at the end of every single letter of Paul, he signs it off by saying, may the grace of God be with you. Every single letter, you'll find a statement of the grace of God because it totally overwhelmed him. He received what he never, ever could have earned at the mercy and the kindness of God. You see, a gracious giver gives knowing that the receiver cannot return the favor. This is exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 14, he speaks about the overflowing grace God has given to us in Christ. So we've got to be generous givers. We've got to be gracious givers. But just to tie this all together, it comes again out of this scripture. We've got to be grateful givers. You see, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift what you receive through Jesus Christ is beyond words you'll never describe the kindness and the love the mercy and the goodness of God because it is beyond description what Jesus did for us on the cross is his gift of love that is too good for words an attitude of gratitude is actually good for your health did you know that? Grateful people are healthier and happier people. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he stood against Hitler and the Nazi regime. He was a great pastor in Germany. And eventually he was executed because of the stand that he took. But he said this, it is only with gratitude that life becomes rich. Billy Graham, that great American evangelist, through whose ministry tens of thousands came to know Jesus as their saviour. Billy Graham said this, a spirit of thankfulness is one of, is one of the most distinctive marks of a Christian whose heart is attuned to the Lord. Do you have a spirit of thankfulness or do you have a spirit of grumbliness? And I found this great statement by uh, a Baptist missionary, William Ward, he lived in the late 1700s and early 1900s, but it is a terrific statement. He says this, God gave you the gift of 86,400 seconds today. Have you used one of them to say thank you yet? Do you know, I wasn't sure of the maths, so I got my calculator out and it's right. 86,400 seconds every day. How many of those do you use to say thank you? An attitude of gratitude is so good to have. And oftentimes, when we think of giving in relation to church, we generally equate it with tithing. Tithing is a good principle. But people often say to me, well, you never find tithing mentioned in the New Testament. That's true. It's only mentioned once Jesus drew attention to it on one occasion. But it was very much ingrained in the Jewish culture, so they didn't need to teach about it. But let me give you a fresh understanding of what we understand by tithing. Okay, in the Old Testament, tithing was a requirement of the law of God. They had to do it. Not only a tenth of their money, but a tenth of their crop, a tenth of what they grew. There was so much law that required that they gave at least a tenth, and often more to the work of the temple and their religious leaders. In the New Testament, giving is a response to the grace of God. One is legalistic, the other is out of the gratitude of my heart. If you're grateful for what Jesus has done for you, then you'll have a right attitude when it comes to giving. You'll always be seeking to excel in your quest to give out of your gratitude to God. Mother Teresa tells a moving story about a six-year-old orphan boy 
The sisters had rescued him from the streets of Calcutta where he was dying of fever and they nursed him back to health. On the day that he was to leave for another home, they gave him a small packet of sugar, a highly prized commodity among the poor. A quarter of a kilo of sugar equaled a day's wages. As the little boy walked through the gates, he saw the sisters carrying another child who was obviously in great need. He walked straight over to them and handed the sugar to the sisters, saying that he wanted the sick boy to have it. Mother Teresa asked him why he had done it. The little boy said, I think that is what Jesus would have done. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Excelling in giving is being like Jesus. So when it comes to financial giving to this church and to the work of the kingdom of God, what is your attitude? Last August, Janice and I were on holiday um, in Dorset with our daughter and husband and two little granddaughters. And often when we're on holiday, we, we like just to go into Church of England churches because they're generally open, have a look around, see what's happening. We visited one and I picked up this leaflet Six Steps in Christian Giving. I thought, well, that's good. Church of England, they've got this right. So I'm going to give you an attitude test. See where you fit in your attitude towards giving. Okay. First of all, do you have a survival attitude? The literary says, I give a bit when I'm asked because the church ought to be there when I need it, like the RNLI. If you fall overboard, it's really nice that they're quickly there. Call the Coast Guard. Do you treat the church like that? I just want it to be there when I need it, when I'm a bit sick, when I'm in an emergency, when I'm stuck. Is that your attitude when it comes to giving towards the church? Or do you have an attitude of the supermarket? I'm happy to pay for the bits of the church that I need. Yeah, we've, we've, got, we've got a meal coming up. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a bit towards that. Or if there's a day out that we're having, yeah, I'll pay my bit towards that. So do you treat the church like a supermarket? You'll pay for the bits that you want. Or do you treat the church... Be like cancer research. I'll support it because the work of the church is important. Or do you have an attitude that says, like a gym membership, subscription. As a member of the church, I want to contribute my share to the costs. I want it to be clean. I want it to be tidy. I, I want the toilets not to be smelly. I want a cup of coffee when I've finished. Occasionally a nice cake like we had last week. So, yeah, I'll pay my subscription so I get out of it what I think I should have from my membership. Or do you have an attitude that simply says, I want to be submissive. I understand that being a disciple of Jesus Christ means that I should put God first. Or better still, do you have an admission of sacrifice, an attitude of sacrifice? I believe that making Jesus Christ Lord means he demands my life and my all. It's interesting, isn't it? The attitude we have towards giving to the work of God. Where do you fit in? I think the last two are the ones that we should be working for and living out. So how to excel in the gracious act of giving? Well, being generous, being gracious, being grateful. And Jesus said on one occasion something very special. He said, give away your life. Don't try and keep it. 
If you give away your life, you'll find it given back, but not merely given back, but given back with a bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way generosity begets generosity. Perhaps the music team will come back. Can you stand with me? Often, when it comes to talking about money, it's, it's awkward, it's difficult. It's personal, it's private. And sometimes when we talk about giving to God and the work of the kingdom, we've been challenged to give something extra towards some of our young adults that are going to go on this conference. And I know that the investment that's made in their lives at this conference will be incredibly life-changing. We have a missionary, Jack, who's serving God out in Kenya and uh, Uganda. And there are many other great Christian causes that we're called to give towards, and it's absolutely right. But what's more important is the attitude in which we give. You see, most of you here pay tax. I wonder what your attitude is to paying your tax. Are you excited? Are you thrilled? Do you say, yeah, I want to bless the tax man. You know, I want to bless our government. You know, I'm going to give a bit extra tax this month. You know, they're not really taking enough off of me. No, it doesn't go down very well, does it? Because you have an attitude. You have an attitude towards paying your tax. And if the tax comes down in the budget or the chancellor changes it, your attitude gets a bit lighter. So what's your attitude towards giving to God? You know the generous grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was rich, but he became poor so that you might be rich. Father, you know our hearts. You actually know them better than we know them. And Lord, if we're struggling to honor you with our finances, then I just want to pray for a release by your Holy Spirit. Help us to remember that everything we are blessed with in life, you loan to us and you trust us with it. And you're looking to see that we use it well for the glory of your name and for the good of others. And I simply want to pray that, Lord, if, if we've got wrong attitudes where money is concerned, if we've got wrong attitudes where giving is concerned, Holy Spirit, will you help us? Will you help us to align ourselves with the attitude and the behavior of Jesus, knowing that as we live as Jesus does, we will never go short. I pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing a song as we conclude this morning. Mm -hmm.